Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're there in Exodus chapter 20. Keep your place there. We're going to be going back and forth there in Exodus chapter 20 throughout the sermon. So we're finishing up tonight the boot series. The poor boot series got booted several times um, over the last couple months, I think, but we started it. Um, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 5.11 and the six sins that will get you booted out of church and, you know, that will cause for someone to actually have to be put out of the church. I'll just read it for you one last time. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5.11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. So tonight we're talking about the last of these um, sins in this list, which is idolatry. And I don't know why I picked that one to be last. I think I was kind of thinking about the sins that people might struggle with. Idolatry is probably not something that, um, you know, literal idolatry is probably not something that many Baptists struggle with. But we're talking about idolatry tonight. And in, in Exodus chapter 20, we see the verse about um, the Ten Commandments and Moses given the Ten Commandments. So what is idolatry? As we begin tonight, you know, what is idolatry? you know, idolatry according to the Bible. Look down at Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Turn to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. So what is idolatry? So here we see in verse number 4 that the Bible talks about not making um, a graven image. Not making a graven image. And if you look at Leviticus chapter 26, the Bible um, defines this further for us where it says, He shall make you no idols nor graven image, equating the graven image with an idol. So making a graven image is something that is commanded against in Exodus 20 when Moses was given the Ten Commandments. Okay? So what, what are the idols? You know, what, what are they? You know, what... What do they mean? What, what do they, you know, what do they signify? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And when you're there, I'm gonna, when you're going there, I'm going to read for you Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 18, where the Bible reads, What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath given it, the molten image, and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. So he's talking about graven images being dumb idols. Are you there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Look down at verse number 2, where the Bible says, "Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as we were led. So the Bible tells us that the idol itself is nothing. The idol itself is a piece of wood. It's a piece of you know, brass or stone or silver or whatever. It's nothing. It's dumb. If you remember Dagon, when the ark was put in, the, it just, he just fell on his face and his head and hands broke off. And I mean, the idol is nothing. Okay, so that's the Bible tells us that the idol I itself I I is nothing. It doesn't have any power. It, it's not a god. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just a piece of wood, the Bible says. Okay, so the question, I mean, it begs the question of this nothingness. If man, you know, if man is just left to himself, God looks down on this earth and man's just left to himself and he just starts carving all these idols. I mean, why? You ever wonder that? What would compel men to make idols? Turn to Revelation in chapter 9. The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us what would compel men to make idols. What would compel men to make those sculptures that are a block down the street on the corner of the building? What would compel men to make that? I mean, somebody made that, right? Look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse number 20. 
And the Bible says this, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So they were worshiping devils and these idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and of wood. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 20. And the Bible says, But I say that the things with the gen which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. In other parts of the New Testament, the Bible talks about, you know, whether or not you should eat things sacrificed to not devils. It, it replaces that with idols. Okay, so these idols represent devils. These idols represent demons on this earth. That's where they come from. That's what compels men to make idols. It's demonic influence on men is what compels them to do so. And when you look at some of these idols, when you look at the artistic things that we'll see in this world, it's very easy to see that that is not of God. Amen. So that's where these idols come from. Have you ever looked at like the Hindu gods? Yeah, I was going to actually print out a picture of one, but I decided not to. You know, if you look at like Kali, the Hindu god, you know, and any kind of artistic representation of that, it's like this, this demon with all these arms, with like men's heads you know, around his neck, and he's like got these, it's just bloody, and he's just murdering people, and I mean, it's demonic. It's very clear to see that it's, it's demonic. You know, no man who is saved or has the Spirit of God in him is going to create an idol like that. It's very clearly, you know, some things that we can see in this world are just very clear evidence of Satan's presence here on earth. And, you know, that's what we should use those things for is to just notice that so we know what we're up against. We know what we're fighting against here. But that's where the idols come from. Okay, it's demonic influence. It's demonic influence. So, you say idolatry today. You know, is there really idolatry today? I mean, who's going to get kicked out of church for idolatry? Hopefully nobody, you know, that we know, right? But idolatry in America is huge. And you know where idolatry in America is huge? This little organization called the Catholic Church yeah. is huge into idolatry. You know, the, the, the formation of Roman Catholicism was born in idolatry. It was born in idolatry. It was this mix of, you know, Roman paganism with, you know, Christianity that, that mixed in. That's what Constantine created in 313 A.D., he created, I mean, if you've ever read about the religion of the Romans, you know, before they decided, you know, they were persecuting the Christians from 60, 70 A.D. all the way through 313 A.D. And by the way, they still continue persecuting the Christians after that, except it was Catholics persecuting people who weren't joining with the Catholic Church. But if you read about, not to get off on that rabbit trail, but if you read about the Roman religion before it joined with, you know, the Christian leaders of the day before Constantine brought this weird mix together, it's, it's confusing. It's almost so complicated. I mean, there's so many different gods. I mean, there's so many different... Um, I mean, the emperors, the Caesars were declaring themselves as God. I mean, it, it's really confusing. I mean, the, the actual story of the foundation of Rome goes something like this. It, it's, it's these... Mars, the god of war, had a child with this woman, and it was these twins, and they were sent down the river, and they were raised by, uh, this is the story of Romulus and Remus, and they were raised by a wolf. I mean, this is normal, right? This happens all the time. So they were raised by a wolf, and then these two boys were rescued, and they became shepherds. And then they went to Rome, and they got in this huge fight, this power struggle over who was going to rule Rome, because they're half God, right, these men. And then Romulus kills Remus, and Romulus forms this, the, the nation of Rome, city of Rome, right? And that begins the Roman Empire. 
And I mean, it's just so confusing. And then you take the Greek mythology and you twist it into it because the, you know, the Greek mythology gets twisted into the, the paganism of the Roman Empire as well. It's really confusing, but it's just full of idolatry and goddess worship and all this crazy paganism is what it is. So when Constantine, you know, married up, you know, he decided that he was going to try to rule the world through the power of this new faith that was taking over everything that they couldn't get rid of because they couldn't kill them all. They tried. You know, you want to get, you know, Baptists fired up, start killing us. So he couldn't get rid of it. So he's like, you can't beat them, join them. So they just married it all up. And that's where all these Catholic idols come from that are still around today. You know, just a couple examples. You know, uh, Rome had to find a replacement for the goddess, wor goddess worship. There is absolutely no history of worshiping Mary before 313 A.D. Shocking. But it was perfect. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Hey, we can give the pagans their goddess. It, it fits perfectly. You know, the, the Pope... You know, since the formation of the Roman Empire, most emperors, including Constantine himself, by the way, declared themselves Pontifex Maximus, which is the, the pagan high priest. And in 337 AD, the Emperor Gratian didn't want to declare himself the pagan high priest. So guess who took over? The bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. And from then on, you have your pope that everyone worships, you know, as the supreme leader. Look, that is how a pagan priest became the pope, right there. They, I mean, and, I mean, this is really its own sermon series, but you want to you read a history that is filled with murder and sodomy and rape and incest and bestiality and all the sickest, twistedest, most things you could possibly imagine in history, read the history of the popes. Amen. It's disgusting. The things that these men did, and, and they're on record, they're on record saying, uh, some of them, that they did these things. I mean, it's not historical question marks. I mean, you have to be willingly blind to, to not want to go out and find these things out. Okay, back, back to, I, you know, you talk about a cult. I mean, it's the biggest cult in America today. Back to idolatry. So, when you look at Exodus chapter 20, the Catholics have a problem. Because the Bible says, don't make any graven images. So, they did a lot of things. They had councils. And, you know, the Council of Trent in 1563, they basically said it was lawful to have idols because people were questioning it. A couple of quotes I have here. The Catholic Council of Trent declared it is lawful to have images in the church and to give honor and worship to them. Images are put in churches that they may be worshipped. The images of Christ, of the Virgin Mother of God, and of other saints are to be retained, particularly in temples and churches, and that due honor and veneration are to be given to them. Veneration is like this, this secondary worship that Catholics, it's a word that they use so they can, they can get away with worshiping saints and Mary and all these things. And they don't say, oh, it's not the same kind of worship we give God. Yeah, whatever, right? I mean, great profit is derived from sacred images. Great profit. So they think that they have power that these images have power. By the images which we kiss and before which we uncover the head and prostrate ourselves, we adore Christ, we venerate the saints whose similitude they bear. And then it goes into relics. I mean, how many of you ever heard of relics? Any of you ever been to a church, an Orthodox or Catholic church outside the United States of America? So I was in Armenia about 15 years ago and I was still Lutheran at the time, but I went and I visited a lot of these churches on my spare time. I mean, the most beautiful churches you'll ever see. Marble everything. I mean, blocks of marble bigger than you could even imagine. Bigger than suburbans building these churches. Hundreds of feet tall. Beautiful interiors of these churches. And I was in the, the main church in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. And in the, the back center of the church, they have this shrine and granted, I was Lutheran at the time. 
So, I mean, I was kind of Catholic light myself. I, they had this shrine in the back, and you go up this big marble staircase, and there's a little glass window that you look in, and it's a finger bone of one of the saints. It's like a finger, it's a human finger bone. And I mean, I mean, you wouldn't even believe it. I mean, these I mean, there's women there. They're just like, they're, they're scarves and they're like this. And there's a guy, it's his job to just wipe the glass with some kind of cleaner every 10 minutes. Because there's people just like slobbering all over the glass. And I mean, they're just worshiping this finger bone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're a cult. What? I mean, it's, it's the strangest thing ever. I mean, I mean, look, forget, I mean, it, it's crazy. You ever, you ever wonder, by the way, you ever wonder why God buried Moses? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I don't want people cutting him up and worshiping his bones. I mean, God buried him, and the Bible says that, you know, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, 6, and he buried him in a valley of Moab uh, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Thank goodness. Thank you, God, for burying Moses and not telling us stupid idiots where you put the body. I mean, it is the strangest thing ever. Okay, Now, look, th this Catholic idolatry, I mean, just think about it. I mean, we're, in this country, we're actually probably a little too used to it, I think. But think about how strange it is. I mean, just think about, no one, no one knows what Jesus looks like, yet everybody's painting his picture. Think, think about that. Think about how weird that is. What if I told you, like, hey, I have this friend. His name is George. He's a really good friend of mine. I, he's, he's a good friend of mine. And we're like, Where, what does he look like? I'm like, well, here, here, this, here's George. <laughs> <clears throat> what? This is George. How about if I made it like some naked picture of George? That'd be even weirder. Right? I was like, well, you know, I got this other friend. His name's Brother Ryan. Here. What? Does he look like this? I have no idea. It's weird. You see my point? I mean, it's, I'm being funny, but it's, it's strange. It's, it's, it's sickening, really. Wouldn't that be uh, insulting to Brother Ryan? Huh? I mean, this is my friend, Brother Ryan. That's insulting to him. Brother George. It's insulting. I mean, look at his teeth. Look, it's insulting. You want to insult God? I mean, it, it's blasphemous is what it is. To make some, some sculpture of the Lord Jesus Christ who is naked and put him in, in, a, in a church for everyone at the center, for everyone to look up, that's not even him. I mean, to make paintings where he's some, you know, and he's holding a sheep, and it's not even him. It's not even him. It, it's just they're making fake, they're making fake gods. And while they're doing it, they're insulting the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how hard is it to understand that no one knows what Jesus looks like? And to go and make some stupid painting that has nothing to do with what he actually looks like, who would even make a portrait of somebody that they don't even know what they look like? It's weird, but just because there it's this major Catholic church that everyone's used to, we're all we're all desensitized to it. It should make us mad. It should make us sick. I mean, they're insulting the Lord Jesus Christ. These popes are a bunch of perverts and sickos. And everybody knows it. And all the priests, the priests today are the same. And then they just, they just insult the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to burn them in the lowest pit of hell for this. So how does God feel about idolatry? All that being said, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. This is why we have to, this is why we have to reach the Catholic in Fresno. Amen. 
And Catholics are some of the most, the easiest people to get saved. Because their religion is the dumbest thing you could possibly think of when it comes to what the Bible actually says. I mean, we're just going to look at a couple things tonight. But when, it looks, when you look at what the, the Catholic Church teaches and what the Bible actually says, that's why Catholics are so easy to get saved. Because an honest Catholic will tell you that he has no idea if he's going to heaven. No idea. An honest, humble Catholic will tell you that. And when you show them what the Bible says, see, they, the beauty of the Catholic sitting in the pews is that in their mind they believe the Bible. But they don't know what it said because these wicked people have been lying to them their whole life. Yep. So that's why when you open the Bible and you show them and you say, do you believe these things? They say, yeah, because it's in the Bible. Amen. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse number 15. The Bible says, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, and the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and put it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Deuteronomy 13, verse number, verse number 1 through 5. Go to Deuteronomy 13, verse number 1 through 5. The Bible reads, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and, given thee a get, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass... Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he has spoken... He has spoken to turn away you from the Lord your God. We'll just stop reading there. God, you know, says, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven image. And he says, If you have somebody who's telling you to turn away and worship other gods, whether those be idols or whatever, they should just be put to death. Amen. Period. Now, what qualifies today as an actual idol? I'm going to give you that from the Bible right now. Okay? There's many differing opinions on this, by the way, even amongst Baptists. But we'll just do a little Bible study. What are the Ten Commandments? Look at Exodus. I'll just read Exodus 34. Go back to Exodus 20. We're going to do a quick study of the Ten Commandments. I'm not quite done with the Catholics yet, but we'll do a quick study of the Ten Commandments. Because you know what? They get that one wrong, too. The Ten Commandments. And they get it wrong in such a stupid way. Exodus 34, 28 says, well, you say the Ten Commandments. What do you mean the Ten Commandments? And there was there with the Lord 40... There, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. He wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So the Bible tells us there's these Ten Commandments. And Exodus 20 lists them for us. All right? Now, in order to understand what an actual idol is, let's just do a quick study of the Ten Commandments. We'll do this in five minutes. The first commandment, verse number three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment. Thou shalt not make, make unto thee a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse number six. Um, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So verses number 4, 5, and 6 talk about the second commandment, thou shalt make an, uh, not make a graven image. All right? Commandment number 3, verse number 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Commandment number 4 is verse number 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then verses number 9, 10, 11 describe keeping the Sabbath day. Okay? Verse number 12, honor thy father and mother, is commandment number 5. Verse number 13, thou shalt not kill, is commandment number 6. 
Thou shalt not commit adultery is commandment number seven. Thou shalt not steal is number eight. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor is commandment number nine. And then verse number 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything as thy neighbor's, is commandment number 10. So there you have one through 10. Now, the Catholics have a problem with commandment number two. So they basically get rid of it. Yep. All right, they just delete it. And then what they do is they just take the, the, Catholic, they take the covetous commandment in verse number 17, and they split it into two commandments. And, here, and they split it in a really stupid way, too. Especially after the sermon this morning. The Catholic Nine Commandment is, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. So apparently, like, the house deserves its own special commandment. And the Catholic Ten Commandment is, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, or anything that's in the neighbor's. Now, look, just to respect the wife a little bit more than that, I would have made her her own commandment and put the property you know somewhere else yeah. but they basically split this thou shalt not covet into two commandments to make up for the one they deleted yeah. all right so I mean back to the the Ten Commandments so look back at commandment number two which is verses four five and six Thou, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above or is in the earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. Then in verse 5, thou shalt not bow, thyself, bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity. Verses 4 and 5 are the same commandment. Okay? That means that a religious image that you bow down to, that you worship, is an idol. Okay? A religious image, a, uh, a statue that has religious connotations is an idol. Look, if it's an image of any kind, and then you have to also say that, you know, thou shalt not worship that image, now you have 11 commandments is the problem with that. All right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that statues of saints, Mary, pictures, statues of Jesus... All these different, any religious image basically is an idol, according to the Bible. Look, even Catholic, I mean, Catholic necklaces and medallions, those are idols. I remember I was given by um, someone in my family, I don't remember who, a, a, a necklace when I was a kid of St. Anthony. And if I ever lost anything, I was just supposed to pray to this idol on my neck and I would find my keys or whatever. I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's real. I mean, you think all these things are funny, brother. But unfortunately, they're real. I'm just joking with you. But it, it's, it's real. It has religious people are worshiping it in a way. They're giving it veneration. Okay? A statue, our neighbors used to have a statue, I suppose it was Mary, in the trees in their, in their, uh, their farm. Like, I'm just like, what is she doing? Is she, I mean, I had dogs to watch for coyotes, you know, but apparently she had a statue. Yeah. But it did something for her. It was some kind of protection or something for their home, for their yard, for their farm, whatever. So any image, look, the deer heads on my wall at home are not an idol because they have no religious connotation. They have no, you know, I don't worship them. Right. Not anymore. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But you see, they have no religious connotation. If you take it to, you know, people can take it a little too far, in my opinion, that, you know, anything that's carved is, you know, I mean, how far are you going to go with that? Yeah. You know, your kid's, you know, toy soldier is an idol. You know, that, that's, that, that's where you kind of, that's where you run in. And I'm not, you know, upset at anybody that takes things that far or anything. But the, the point is that, you know, the, the, the stance of this church, anyway, is that, any religious image or carving or anything that has any kind of religious connotation, anything religious in general, even if you're not worshiping, I would stay away from it, Amen. personally. Because, I mean, people think that these things, they, they put these pictures in their house and they put these statues in their house for a reason because there's a thought in their mind that this is doing something for their home. Even the cross on the wall. Yep, that's good. 
Even the cross on the wall, there's, there's a thought that that piece of wood is giving them some kind of religious protection or something. The cross around your neck, the same thing. You think that it's giving you some kind of protection or something. That's an idol. It's a religious carving. You need to stay away from those types of things. Okay? Look, I mean, the Bible says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And he's right to be jealous. I mean, one of the things that you will read about God's personality throughout the Bible is that God wants the credit for what he has done. He wants all the credit. And people get into a lot of trouble in the Bible when they do not give God the credit. And having an idol, even, even ignorantly, is taking credit from God. Yeah. Is taking credit from the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done you know, for us. 1 Timothy 2.5, the Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus. That's all we need. Amen. We don't need, you know, saints or, I mean, you know, I mean, not to get back on that again, but I mean, we, we don't need any of that. Amen. You don't need the cross above your door to guard your house. Amen. Why don't you just get down on your knees and just pray to the Lord Jesus Christ that He protect your house? Amen. Why don't you just get down on your knees and pray to the Lord Jesus Christ? that He protect your family. Amen. That He heal your child. Amen. That He give you, uh, you know, fix problems that you have. Amen. You don't need anything. You don't have to rub anything. You don't need to put anything in your yard. Just pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And if you're saved, the, the, the Bible says that God will hear you. Amen. You know, there's one mediator, and it's the man Christ Jesus. That's, that's it. Right. Pray to Him. So, I, I don't have a lot to say about idolatry tonight, but you may not have physical idols you know, in your home, but there is another thing out there called you know, idols of the heart. Right? Remember 1 Kings chapter 11? Go ahead and turn there. 1 Kings chapter 11. We'll go to 1 Kings chapter 11, and then we'll go to Matthew 13, and then we'll, we'll finish up from there. Look, God, you know, God wants the credit for everything. That's why it's all grace, salvation. Amen. That's why it can't be, you know, even a little bit works. Yeah, right. You know, remember Romans eleven six. You know, if it be works, if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. So that's why, the, you know, we run into these people like all the time that are just it's believing and works, and you have to get them off of that. Because that's not salvation. And you say, why isn't it salvation? They believe in Jesus, but they also just believe that you know, they have to be good. Because God wants the credit for what He did. That's why. I mean, He was, he was beaten and tortured and He went to hell for crying out loud. I mean, He wants the credit for it. So it can't even be a little bit of works. That's why. It makes sense. If I've done something so great for you, you're going to give me all the credit for it before you get that gift. That's it. That's why it's all grace. And not even a little bit works. Alright, are you in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse number 4? We read this this morning. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So you see here that there are things other than physical idols. There are things in your life that can turn your heart away from God. In this case, it was Solomon's wives. It was all these, these women, these, these wives and concubines that he married. Now look, now this, is a, this is a fairly big problem today. And I'm not going to get too deep into this because I believe 1 Corinthians 5.11 is talking about you know, actual idolatry. But idolatry, the heart, is, is a huge problem in America. Did you turn to Matthew 13? It's a huge problem in America, and I'm telling you that you are going to struggle with it in your life as a saved believer. 
And what do I mean? I mean anything that takes your focus off of the spiritual can be considered uh, an idol of your heart. Amen. Anything that takes your heart away from the Lord. This is why you know I left my career that I was in. Because I didn't want this happening. Because I know that your heart can really only be in one place. And God knows that. And I want my heart to be here. Look, chasing after riches, material possessions, houses, cars, whatever. That's all, those are all idols that can become idols in your life. You know, we talked about um, talking about dress standards. We talked about, you know, women, you know, hanging on to this idea and not wanting to completely give over to what the Bible says. Something like that that you're hung up on and you can't just read the Bible and listen to what it says and just do it, that's an idol in your life. It's slowing you up. It's stopping you from growing. Look at Matthew 13. This is the parable of the sower. Look down at verse number 22. And he also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he become unfruitful. So what's the danger in your life of these, these idols? Whether it be, you know, hang-ups that you have in the Bible, or whether it be, you know, God, God blessing you in your life. Don't be this guy, by the way. Don't be this guy that gets into church and starts doing the right things and gets it together and gets a, a job and works hard like he's supposed to and then God comes and he blesses that and then you let it choke you spiritually. Don't be that guy. Don't be Solomon. Don't have to write the book of Ecclesiastes at the end of your life, please. Solomon already did it for you. Let's just take that and, and learn it. Learn from it. So anything, you know, anything, the thorns of this world that can just turn your heart from the Lord, those are your idols. So we see that, you know, there is actual idolatry today. We've actually been desensitized to it. It should offend us way more than it does already. You know, this whole, you know, idolatry of the, of the Catholic Church that is so common in this country today, it should just offend the living daylights out of us. Amen. Because that is our Lord and Savior that they are blaspheming and basically, you know, insulting. So that's the physical idolatry. But us, ourselves, you say, I don't have any of those things. You know, if you do get rid of them, because the Bible says so, because it's, it's stealing credit from God. But watch out for these, these heart idols, too. Just be careful. Be careful in your life that you don't take God's blessings and stab Him in the back with them. Because that's what it is, right? I mean, imagine. You get it together. God, God blesses you with a family. He blesses you with, with promotions at work. He, you know, you're, you're financially well off. And then you take and you just turn on God because of those things. I mean, some, some friend you are. But, but we do it all the time. Men greater than any men in this room have fallen from this. Have gotten choked from this. Have fall, I mean, look at men that you know, men of God, that have just fallen smack on their face. I mean, don't think that you are immune to any of it. So we need to be, we need to be watch, watching. We need to watch each other. Because many times, here, here's another thing. Many times, you will not see it yourself, but maybe your brother will. I've seen this on both ways, where, you know, a brother is just getting really, like, backslidden, and just, he's just caring way too much about the things of the world, and he's slipping out of church, and he's not going soul winning anymore. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens just a little bit at a time. Everybody else sees it, but he doesn't see it. So let's just be watching for each other. I'm not talking be nosy. Let's just be watching for each other because these things can creep in on us too. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your word, Lord. We thank you for your law. 
Lord, we thank you for the uh, Ten Commandments and just making your law clear to us, Lord. Lord, I pray for all those people out there that are just caught up in false religion. I pray that um, you humble their hearts, Lord, so when we knock on those doors, they'll be ready to hear the truth and we'll be ready to tell them, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you so much for the, the soul winning today, Lord. What a, what a blessing. Um, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the power of your word and the privilege that I have and, and the people in this room, Lord. I mean, I just I thank you so much for letting me be a small part of this. And I just pray that you continue to bless this ministry and, and, the, people in, and the people in this city, Lord. Just uh, help, us, help us reach them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.